audience online can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and can I start? Yes, let me introduce you. So our second speaker is Dr. Farok Atazar from New York University, and his talk is entitled Deep Learning for Human Machine Interface Through Peripheral Neural Decoding. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks. So, uh, thank you, the organizers, for having me here. It's an amazing workshop. It's a great pleasure to be here today. And uh, I really enjoy the workshop, panel discussion and everything. So I hope that you enjoy the talks. So. Uh, my name is Farouk Ataysa, uh, Assistant Professor at New York University, jointly appointed between Electrical and Mechanical Engineering Departments and a couple of um, uh, centers. At NYU, I lead the lab called Medical Robotics and Interactive Intelligent Technologies, or MERIT Lab with double I. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I, I actually want to start by like introducing some of our activities before going to the topic of the talk. Farouk, can, can I, sorry to interrupt, we are seeing the uh, speaker notes on Zoom and not the actual presentation. Okay, okay, hold on. Corrected? All right, fantastic. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so sorry for technicality. Uh, those of you who know me, uh, you may know me through the telehaptics, tele telerobotics work that I've done, and also in application in telesurgery and telerehabilitation. I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about the new adventure of my research lab, at, uh, uh, which relates to the topic of this uh, workshop, Neural Interfaces for Agile Control Neural Robotics. And here you can see some of the results of our different projects happening in the lab. And uh, in the next slide, you can see again, some of our uh, technologies and other work. So if you're interested in any, any of these topics, please, please find me, let's talk, you can always email me. So let's uh, get to the topic of this uh, presentation and which is this, can robots learn to decode the neurophysiology of motion intention, uh, which directly relates to the topic of this workshop. So uh, we are at IRIS, right? So some of you, and I think all of you have seen amazing robotic system, advanced robotic system for other applications, robots that can jump, that can backflip, dance, do amazing stuff, make colonies fly. And these videos actually are old now. So every year you have more of these amazing videos, right? So amazing technology, kudos to all of you. Great work, well done. So let's see what we've done for our people, people in need. So this is an ancient technology. I'm sure you may have heard about it. Sixth century, they put wheel and chair, they call it wheelchair, right? So uh, engineers at a time. And now that's what we have, wheelchair. So of course it's not, not surprising. And of course there's a degree of exaggeration. There's a technological push. I mean, we agree on that. There was a technological push and that we made it foldable. So definitely not enough, meaning that uh, there's a need. There's a need for us coming together, trying to make these robots and, uh, more accessible. So anyways, um, let's talk about bionic limbs. Uh, you can see amazing uh, technologies uh, made by, again, engineers. Mechatronic designs are all good. The motivation of this technology is, unfortunately, every year we have 185,000 new cases of amputation in the United States because of trauma, cancer, diabetes, so on and so forth. Some of them are congenital. So uh, currently, uh, if somebody loses the limb, uh, they lose whole degree of freedom, voluntary control, multi multimodal perception. And the best we can do is to measure signals from the muscles. Uh, we call it EMG electromyography, force myography, or mechanomyography. We process them through decoding, through learning, machine learning, pattern recognition, so on and so forth, to control a prosthetic limb, right? So that's a whole process. An ideal human-machine interaction or human-machine interface uh, has all the following five items, intuitive control, accurate control, agile control, multi degree freedom, and biofeedback. But unfortunately, currently, we have none of those that I mentioned. Uh, there was a lot of amazing uh, improvement in terms of making mechatronic designs of uh, prosthetic hands. You can see a lot of amazing robotic prosthesis. Looks fancy, all the degree of freedom. But when it comes to control, we basically do mode switching, like Morse coding, right? So we put the couple of electrodes on the muscle. We say two contraction hand open, three contraction hand closed, and then the user should memorize them. So some of these companies, they did an amazing job. They put a counter in these prosthetic hands and they give it to the, to the people who use that. And they find out that the first couple of weeks they're using these prosthetic hands, they are all excited about it. The users, like it's a new gadget, right? So they use it like when you get a new phone. Uh, whatever for a couple of weeks you try to check all the functionality and after a couple of weeks they just turn it off and use it as a mechanical extension why because of the control is not intuitive and how we can make it better and make it work actually is the one of the, the new directions of my lab i'm talking about it now so 
there's active R&D in the field. Uh, and there's a lot of works. Of course, we are not the only one doing this research. There has been a lot of amazing research in the literature. Um, so people work at the sensor level, making new sensors, high density electromyography. We're going to talk about it today. Mechanomyography, force myography, sonomyography, amazing research, great work. And uh, there are people who work on actually the low level control, meaning that how we can actually go deeper into the neurophysiology by doing something called decomposition to get access to spinal cord activations, motor units in the spinal cord, uh, by processing the high dimensional uh, space of the signals and then use that to control. There are people who work on high, high level uh, uh, Meyer control basically, using machine learning, deep learning to basically uh, control these prosthetic hands. We're gonna talk about that also quickly. And then people who work on the perception, right? The feedback, haptics feedback, tactile feedback, going from uh, non-invasive, um, uh, mechanical vibration, tactile feedback to electro electro tactile feedback, and up to invasive um, um, electrical tactile feedback. So, lots of amazing research, and the future, which we all uh, believe in, is uh, intelligent intuitive robots for limb replacement. So, uh, now I'm going to get back to the research that we do. I don't go to the details on one research. I just want to give you a holistic. A view of what we're doing. If you're interested in any of the following uh, topics, just send me an email. We can talk about it. Uh, always, you're more than welcome. So we try to decode the neural flow, and uh, that's interesting. So on the left, you can see the uh, the conventional electromyography uh, myographic um, uh, sensors like my armband. That some of you are familiar with that. It's, 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 it's discontinued. There are other technologies out there. Uh, a sparse uh, recording of the electrical activity. And then uh, the new technology called high density electromyography or HDSEMG that uh, we and many other teams are working on, uh, which we hope that going from that low dimensional signals on um, uh, signal space to the high dimensional space of high density electromyography, you can get more information uh, from what's happening at the at, at the muscle level, right? Because the moment you want to move your hand, what happens is that there's a signal generated in your brain going to motor cortex. From there, it goes to the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, there is this alpha motor neuron that they um, generate the spikes, that the spikes goes through the nerve to the muscle. The spike surface through the muscle fat the skin tissue at the surface of the skin, you pick it up. We call it electromyography, right? So again, these technologies try to pick it up. Um, but again, high density electromagnetic that you see on the right is when you pick it up from different uh, locations densely, and that helps us to better get to understand what's happening inside. You may wonder why. Uh, so if I put one microphone here, and everybody here in this room talks, I get a mixture of everybody talking to one microphone, right? If I put 20 microphones in this room, and again, everybody talks, I get 20 independent observation of the same convolutory mixture. Right. So there are algorithms that allow us to decompose or deconvolve that mixture, 20 observation of those mixture to get access to individual ingredients. Right. So which is great. And here we can do that. And the ingredients for us is basically activations of alpha motor neuron in the spinal cord. And that is called decomposition. So that's why we're interested in high density electromyography. Anyways, so here is an, a snapshot of what you can see in high density electromyography for different uh, upper limb activations on the top you can see the technology that we have in the lab lower limb you can see the same thing that can be used for lower limb amazing work it's now actually the companies are making it uh, wireless so you can connect to the user and the user can walk and jump and run and you can actually get a lot of information so how to process that is the problem so you can see a list of issues here and that is when when you want to go to high density domain there's all the problem that you need to try you need to solve so i'm going to quickly talk about uh, some of them and again, you have a question, reach out to me. First, you have now this sparse uh, electrode space that can everyone would, would work as like an antenna. They pick up a lot of noise, how you can denote this complex dimensionality of uh, biosignals. The second one is how to decompose. The example I told you, right? How to, you can get access to the alpha motor neuron activities and then how you use that information to decode. So assuming you do that, well, it, you can you generalize it over time? Meaning that if you calibrate the system today, can the system be used tomorrow, the day after? Like the second question is that, can you generalize it over subjects? Meaning that if you train it on me, can you use it on you or somebody else, right? So how you robustify this system to lots of problems such as electrode shift, misplacement, displacements. Don't forget our skin, our, our uh, skin is very stretchable. So you put electrode on it, you like flex your arm or whatever, and then that, then you are pushing these electrodes around. How you can make this 
machine learning, artificial intelligence, robust to those misplacement, displacement. And then how you can minimize the amount of data. There was a great discussion today in the panel uh, because medical data is limited, right? So how you can may, may have AI that can, that can be trained on the same system with limited data. And then how you can add, uh, enhance the agility of the system, both from the training, how you can have AI to be trained faster and so that you can recalibrate faster without the need of like 10 HPCs and uh, how you can make this system respond faster to your motion. Like even if you can get the best spatial resolution, if you don't get a good uh, temporal resolution, time-based resolution, it won't work. So how you can address that and then how you can predict rather than estimate. So these are the problems. Uh, I could end my talk right after that because uh, just just talking about these problems that exist is 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 excites me personally. So let's talk about some of the work that we've done um, about this topic. This is a collaboration between me and uh, Dario Freina from Imperial College. This is a featured article on RTP transaction neural system rehabilitation engineering. So the question here was how we can automatically denoise the system without the use of AI. Surprisingly. So uh, here we just generate a simple adaptive uh, filter. And what you see here is that the filter is detecting which electrode is getting detached from the, uh, or having getting, getting noisy and then coming back online. So you can actually track by looking into the information context of the system. And we use information theory, Shannon information theory to understand how this information is being shared. And using that, we are now able to detect the, the quality of contact and use that to enhance the performance of the system. We just show that by basic denoising by basic denoising and the most simple possible machine learning algorithm, you can perfectly detect the four finger activation, very complex problem previously, but now we can do that by simply denoising your uh, input space, the data. So again, um, the related to the panel discussion we had today, there is a, we have a huge data set. Before going to deep learning or before going deep into deep learning, let's just see how you can enhance the quality of the data you have. And maybe a shallow learning algorithm can solve your problem. That can be more practical. And that's actually what we did here. On the top, you can see confusion metrics for without the noise, uh, without the algorithm and with the algorithm at the bottom, you can see the performance going up. So that's, that's amazing research. So the next one is the decomposition. Uh, so decomposition, the example I told you, the microphone and everything, that was an offline ex ex experiment, meaning that those algorithms, the deconvolution works if you do it offline. It's a time consuming process. It's not real time. Nobody can do it in real time. So there's a lot of activities about how we can make it real time. So that was a perfect match for deep learning actually, uh, related to the topic of this workshop, that we have an offline problem. With deep learning, we can make it real time. Right. So, and the, oh, I need to admit somebody. Um, okay, no, okay. okay. Anyways, so uh, that's what we did. So, what you see on the bottom left, you can see an individual amputated. Uh, the nerves are rerouted, connected to the muscle in the chest. You can see the activation of high density. And recording that, and with, uh, uh, you, you get these, uh, we get the decompositions working. But with the use of GRU algorithm, which is a format of RNN, uh, we can nicely track the decoding. So what you see on the top is the offline decoding. What you see here is the online uh, an online decomposition that we can nicely track the activation of every one of those spikes happening. And uh, we actually uh, verified this work by uh, putting uh, by, by the data we had for invasive EMG and the work was published in TBME, Transaction Biomedical Engineering. So Anyway, so assuming we can uh, decompose and decode, uh, the, 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 the noise and decompose, now the question is how we can decode. So here we want to address the following question. Does it really matter if you get access to the spark train activities or not? So what you see uh, here is that uh, for a complex problem, not just activation of the finger, but of when you activate your finger. So looking at the temporal uh, profile, if you do not decompose, the machine learning would be totally confused, right? But when you decompose and get access to alpha motor neuron firing, you can get a very nice uh, uh, classification performance also for all other fingers. So here you can see a 13 class classification and you know this com uh, confusion method is very difficult to, to capture, uh, but it's possible. So each of these uh, blocks have the different phase of the temporal, resting, ascending, descending, and plateau. And you're able to detect when you are activating the fingers and when you're relaxed, when you're uh, when you're relaxing that activation. Again, thanks to this combination of signal processing and machine learning AI deep learning. So anyways, let's go now uh, to the other sort of problem. What if we don't decompose? We want to use the signal space and just use the machine learning and see what are the, how we can solve that. So one of the topics that we discussed at the panel was that let's not just use the machine learning as a, a, as a box that we don't know what's happening inside, but also let's try to see the focus of this. So my team is very excited about this topic of 
uh, explainable AI, right? So when we not only look into the input output relationship of this machine learning algorithm, but also explaining where is the focus or where is the attention of this deep learning. And using that, we can actually understand if the machine learning is really trying to track the performance of not, or not. So the work is actually published in RAL 2020, I think, if you're interested, follow that. So the next, uh, uh, the next topic is agile uh, learning, right? So agile learning is like all these deep learning algorithms, amazing, good uh, techni techniques, they're very slow, right? When it comes to like temporal modeling, they're extremely slow, meaning that every time you need to relearn it, you need to have amazing HP HPC with a lot of computational power. And it's not always available. I mean, of course not available at patient's home. So how we can have deep learning algorithm that are agile in terms of training with, with you can, you, it can converge with less computational need. And here with a simple change of the temporal profile of the, of the LSTM, we actually were able to uh, make the training faster by 20 times. So the deep learning is faster 20 times to decode this process. Um, as one of the other aspects that you're interested to work on is the transient phase or the prediction. So if you classify the transient phase just before the task happens, you are predicting the task. So you can actually send that command to the robot and the robot would act more uh, agilely to that response. And that's another area of research. So. Again, there is this uh, work that we're also doing on combining the spatial resolution and temporal resolution I mentioned earlier. And uh, the next one is on the topic of few-shot learning. So few-shot learning is if you don't have access to the data, there's a lot of amazing algorithm out there, out there called few-shot deep learning, basically, which allows you to somehow enhance your performance with limited data. So the solution exists. So if you have that problem, maybe that can be a solution for one of the work that you do. So generalizability is a big problem. A lot of teams are working on it. As I mentioned, generalizability over different subjects, over different um, days of operation. So very good line of research for young researchers. So if you're interested, talk to me. It is possible to force the neural network to generalize, but that's a very complex problem when it comes to the EMG. So uh, the, 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 the work that we presented at Iris was this one actually when we tried to show that if you get the perfect performance, I may assume that you, you did everything that I mentioned, you get perfect performance with high density. If you move the electrode five millimeter, the performance would go down from 95% to 20%, right? The drop is significant. So that cannot be practical. The question is that how we can make this AI and deep learning more robust to electrode shift, misplacement, displacement, uh, to data augmentation with, uh, without increasing the need of, of data. So that's also happening. So this is a, a kind of some of the work all together. This is a collaboration between my team and Imperial College. I really like this work. So the whole prosthetic hand from sensor domain to the, uh, to, the, to the robot is all made by our students. And you can see that the user is able to actually do this uh, very complex uh, maneuver uh, quite intuitively. Of course, we are still not there, but it's, it is happening, right? So um, again, the, the, the problem, the, the intuitiveness problem is still a challenge. You can see the subjects still have the problem to pick up the last part. So the, it's happening. The next topic I want to very quickly touch is the mechanomyography instead of electromyography, which is another area of research looking into the mechanical response of the muscle. For example, what you see here on the bottom left is a group of undergraduate students trying to detect the vibration of the muscle instead of the electrical activation of the muscle. Amazing work, if you're interested, reach out to me, I can connect you to the students. And the last topic I wanna very quickly talk about is uh, to decode not only the activation, but also the communication of the muscle. Can muscle communicate? And the answer is no, but uh, the signal is sent from the brain to the muscle and the signal is sent down in a very coordinated manner. So you can try to decode the coordinated manner. And it's not just for prosthetic system. So we actually did that on, on people who had like some dysphonia, singers and other uh, people, and uh, the work is published in TBME. And we can actually show that this, with, if you look at the coordination, these graphs can actually have a lot more information than if you look into the individual signal activation. It's called muscle network, a very new field of research. A couple of teams are working on it. So if you're interested, I really suggest that line of work. We did that also on the fatigue. Uh, so before fatigue, after fatigue, you could classify. And the last work, that last slide, which is basically the work we published in Nature, scientific report in collaboration with FDA and Johns Hopkins University, is when we show that using these graphs of muscle connectivity or coordinated activation, you can simply classify the different, uh, different scales of rehabilitation, right? 
So anyways, list of publication, interested following us, and I would like, I, I would like to acknowledge the source of funding, NSF, NIH, FDA, Intuitive Surgical, and uh, NY Wireless. So uh, thank you all again for being here and the organizer. If you have any question, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions from the audience, either in person or virtual or Yes, please. Thank you for a very nice talk. And I'm curious about uh, time varying effect. I mean that the uh, EMG sensing is certain uh, sensitive for sweating or uh, some over time, long time usage. So how do you manage for? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much for asking. Actually, one of the problem with EMG is the sensitivity to the sweat uh, and the changes in electrical uh, impedance. So that's why we are actually going to the direction of mechanomyography. So mechanomyography, when you look at the vibration, uh, mechan mechanical response of the motor unit recru recruitment instead of the electrical responses. And doing that, you can actually uh, kind of bypass that problem. A hybrid solution would be, would be the best. So mechanomyography versus electromyography could be possibly the answer to the question you asked. But great question. Thank you so much. Any other question? Okay, hearing none, in the interest of time, we'll keep moving. Please, thank let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you all.